Music, the program in the extended series which explores some of the music of the English Cathedral Service. Today we visit Canterbury, where the scene is set by John Betjeman. The Cathedral Choir is accompanied by Stephen Crisp and directed by the organist and master of the choristers, Alan Wicks.
That medieval carol was in honour of St Thomas a Becket, and Canterbury is the flower of English cathedrals. Of course, we know Christianity was first brought to this part of England by St Augustine, but what made the cathedral the chief place of pilgrimage in Christendom after Jerusalem and Rome was the shrine of St Thomas a Becket, murdered here in 1170. He was a most famous saint. Miracles occurred at his tomb. The heaviest bell in many a tower is called Tom after him. Canterbury bells are named after the bells on pilgrims' horses. Cantering means riding the easy pace by which the pilgrims came. From the Low Countries they landed at Sandwich, from France at Southampton, and joined people coming from the West along the Pilgrim's Way, which can still be traced through Surrey. Most frequented of all was the route from London by which Chaucer's pilgrims came. To go to Canterbury today still gives you the feeling of a pilgrimage. There are those twin towers on the west front and the lace-like grace of the central tower, Bell Harry, shining whitish-yellow from far off over the apple orchards and oast houses as we approach the city. Then the narrow medieval alleys close in and Bell Harry alone dominates the sky and the cathedral itself is hidden by little houses and the flint walls that surround the precincts. Out of the butter market and through the Tudor stone gatehouse and there's the southwest porch and the whole soaring cathedral with its slender lines of buttresses leading your eye up to the many pinnacled towers. It's no good bothering you with dates and names and history. There's so much of all of them in every stone here that I'd never stop. Let's just continue on our pilgrimage. Now we're inside the cathedral. See that tall nave. The pillars lean out somewhat as they rise, many shafted, to support the fan-vaulted roof. This is in order to give an increased effect of height. And look at that pierced stone girder across the easternmost arch. It's one of four to prop the pillars which support the central tower, Bell Harry. Now we'll go down the north aisle to the place of martyrdom. The building leads you on to more and more vistas. It's a pilgrim church whose end was the shrine. There, in the north transept, sunk below the level of where we're standing, is a stone marking the place where Becket was slain. On now, through this iron grill, towards the shrine, up that long flight of shallow steps. See thou how they've been worn by multitudes of pairs of pilgrims. And look at the vistas here. We're in the Norman part of the church, or rather, Norman turning to pointed Gothic, a style called transitional. The stone came over the water from Caen. This is a French building of the days when France and England were one and called Christendom. The chapels are round-ended. Notice the brightly painted tombs. The recumbent effigy of Henry IV, bearded and with little angels holding up his crown. Look at the intense blues and reds of the stained glass in the round-headed windows. Much of this is 13th century glass and of the same glowing splendor as that of Chartres and Bourges. The high altars on our right screen from us and the church curves inwards as we reach the corona, the crown of the cathedral, at its extreme east end where the shrine of St. Thomas stood. The old glass is there, the pointed arches, the Purbeck marble shafts rising high to a leafy boss, but there's no shrine. Henry VIII had it and every statue of Becket destroyed. This was partly because there was a feeling at the time that offerings to the shrine and making money out of the pilgrims was becoming what we now call a ramp. It may also have been because Henry 
felt that Becket was an anti-king saint. And anyhow, Henry had appointed himself head of the church in England. And east of where the shrine stood is now the marble chair of St. Augustine, where archbishops of Canterbury have been enthroned since Norman times. Now let's go down into the choir. You'll have noticed how rich in medieval splendor Canterbury is, how comparatively slight was the damage done by the Puritans, and how richly the building was restored when Charles II returned to the throne. Look at those Renaissance stalls at the end, there where the dean sits. And you'll see through the screen that 17th century font and painted cover in the lofty nave. Canterbury has always been treasured. It's the heart of the Anglican communion, which now has cathedrals and churches all over the world. We now hear the choir sing this Day Christ Was Born by William Byrd and a setting of the words of Psalm 130 Out of the Deep by Byrd's little-known contemporary Nathaniel Giles.
Next, two settings of Salvator Mundi, one by Bird's teacher and close friend Thomas Tallis, and the other written more than a hundred years later by John Blow, who was organist at Westminster Abbey during Queen Anne's reign.
Canterbury Cathedral has got three organs. And if you go up the little narrow staircase to the top of the small screen, there you'll find all three consoles. The pipes of the large Willis organ are scattered along the south triforium above the choir and can't be heard well from the nave. Apart from anything else, this makes hymn singing with a full congregation difficult. So various experiments have taken place. A few years ago, they bought an electronic organ with numerous speakers, but nobody likes the sound of that. Then recently, walkers have installed a temporary one manual instrument over the screen. And although it's by far the smallest, there are only six tops, it's the only one which you can really enjoy listening to from anywhere in the building. And this is the one that's being used this afternoon. And on it, we hear Alan Wicks play two sonatas by Scarlatti.
two works composed in the last few years. Sacred Songs for Boys' Voices by Alan Ridout, who now comes to Canterbury for two days every week to teach some of the choristers how to compose. And finally, Hymn to St. Columba by Benjamin Britten.